good afternoon to all of you. Um, welcome to this uh, seminar uh, organized by the Philip H. Wong Center for Chinese Law. Um, uh, and also, thank you for coming, uh, especially uh, on this Valentine's Day. I was just talking to Malcolm, and I said that we chose this date uh, because it is easy to remember as Valentine's Day. Um, actually, Malcolm is visiting Hong Kong for two weeks. Two and a half, yes. Yeah, two and a half weeks. But, um, but it's good that he is visiting us uh, on this day. Um, so um, the speaker today, Mr. Malcolm Mary, uh, is a very old friend of mine, and he is also my former colleague who has taught in the Faculty of Law uh, here for many years, maybe 20 or, or 30 years. 20, over 20. Yeah. Over 20 years, um, in, uh, in particularly in the PCLL program, uh, I think. So many generations of lawyers in Hong Kong would know um, Mr. Very personally, um, but he has also practiced as a barrister in Hong Kong, and he has also written widely um, on land law and also uh, Hong Kong's legal history. Um, so today's talk is based on his newly published book. Uh, you can uh, there was uh, an image where people can get a code in which they can buy the book at a discount uh, at the Hong Kong University Press. So the book was published by the Hong Kong University Press uh, just a few months ago uh, called, uh, is it still here? Grounded uh, in Kai Tech, Chinese aircraft impounded in Hong Kong 1949-1992. So, so this book uh, is based on research which Malcolm has done. Um, for many years, and uh, I, I know that uh, he has actually researched in great detail into this particular episode of Hong Kong legal history, which actually is important because it reflected the relationship between colonial Hong Kong and the newly established People's Republic of China, um, established in 1949, and immediately, shortly after the establishment of the PRC, there was this uh, litigation before the Hong Kong courts um, in which um, the dispute was whether the, whether a number of planes, I think there were quite a number of planes, is it, is it 100? 71. 71 planes, so many planes, uh, did they belong to the newly established People's Republic of China or did the uh, the government of the Chinese Nationalist Party, uh, which had uh, moved to Taiwan, uh, had any legitimate uh, right uh, over this aircraft. So, um, so this, so Mr. Mary will be introducing you to you the background and also the litigation before the Hong Kong courts, which uh, went all the way up to the Privy Council. So, without further ado, may I now hand over to. Um, Thank you very much, Alvin. I, I, I hope people can hear me. I've got one of these pocket mics. And just put your hand up if you can't. Yes, as Albert said, this is about 71 aircraft, civil aircraft, uh, which belong to the two main uh, Chinese airlines, CATC and CNAC, both controlled by the Chinese government. Uh, originally, in fact, 82 planes were flown to Kai Tak uh, in the spring and early summer of 1949. They operated out of Kai Tak instead of Shanghai. They'd been taken uh, to Kai Tak to keep them from the advancing communists in China in the Civil War and parked at Kai Tak Air Airfield, as it was called in those days. They the airlines also moved their offices and staff to Hong Kong. Uh, the uh, <coughs> offices were in Central, and there were several hundred staff engaged, mainly based at, at the airfield. Now, I, I, I'm going to cut through to November of 1949, because in that, in that month, 
uh, the majority of the staff defected from the nationalists, the Kuomintang, to the communists. They formed their, uh, their own communist-based union. The discontents had actually been growing <coughs> uh, over the uh, weeks uh, because, of course, the People's Republic had been founded on the 1st of October. Chiang Kai-shek had decamped to Taiwan, or, or Formosa, as it was known in those days. And uh, the uh, staff obviously realised that they were going to be either stuck in the, in Hong Kong or in Taiwan, and therefore they would be far from home and their families. So they they and their, and certain communist sympathisers took control of the planes and and the associated equipment, of millions of dollars in fact of equipment, as well as the eighty two planes. And they declared their allegiance to the new government in Peking. Or as the judges in Hong Kong put it, they turned to the new government. Uh, the general managers and air crew, some air crew, took 12 planes and surreptitiously flew them back to the mainland, I think on the 12th of November, 1949. <laughs> Uh, eventually, one of them returned with the managers who'd been reappointed by the, by the communist government uh, as new managers. So one returned, there were 71 planes at Kai Tak. Um, the next twist to the tail followed in mid-December, 12th of December 1949, when the nationalists sold the air, 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 aircraft and associated equipment, the assets of the two airlines, to an American-owned small airline called CAT. This airline was fronted by a general, Claire Lee Shenault, and his uh, business partner, Whiting Willow, who had operated CAT on the mainland. And they had uh, flown a lot of uh, refugees from China, rich refugees from China to Formosa in the recent past. But their business, of course, had collapsed once that had finished uh, and there was no internal flight, uh, internal flights possible in China. But they were the, they were, as it were, the front men of CAT. Behind the scenes, there were, were some shadowy investors led by a man called Tommy Corcoran. He was actually an associate, close associate of President Roosevelt uh, during the war and the New Deal of the 1930s. And Roosevelt actually gave him a nickname, Tommy the Cork. So Tommy the Cork was in effect a fixer. He did the work behind the scenes for the Democrat administration in the USA. And he had links to uh, the, the uh, Secret Service, in effect, in the US. The US government refused to be involved in this, uh, at least officially. But in effect, the struggle became one between proxies for the United States on the one hand and for the PRC on the other, because the communist sympathizers included uh, people with strong links to the new regime, as well, of course, as, as ordinary workers. Hong Kong and Great Britain were caught in the middle of this. They were obviously embarrassed uh, about the, um, te the tensions between the factions, the nationalists and the, and the communists, the US and the PRC, uh, and they uh, are, actually, they'd asked the Americans to move the aircraft in June of 1949 because the RAF was coming to uh, reinforce in Kai Tak, and the American interests behind the airlines refused to move them. So the uh, result was that the government in Britain and in Hong Kong had to take a neutral position, which they did by saying that title to the aircraft was purely a legal question. 
which had to be decided by the courts in Hong Kong. And throughout the whole saga, this was repeated time and again by the British government, ministers, uh, diplomats. We're not involved in this, it's a matter for the courts, and the courts will decide uh, and we'll see what they say about the legal position. But there were tensions between the UK and the USA uh, about China policy or Far East policy, to be more precise. The, the UK wanted to recognize the new government in Peking. And, and throughout 1949, there have been discussions with the US, with Britain's Commonwealth partners, and also with European powers about the timing of recognition. It was clear that the communists were winning and what to do. Britain was keen to recognize as soon as possible because they harbored hopes, illusions really, that they could salvage Britain's pre-Civil War position in the economy of China. Britain was the dominant Western investor in China, had lots of interests, of course, in Hong Kong, but also in Shanghai. And they thought eventually they would be able to go back into China and resume that position. So they, they kept what they call a foot in the door in China. And that's, that's why they wanted to, to give prompt recognition, because they thought that that would show a friendliness to the new regime. The US, on the other hand, didn't have that concern, of course. And the Truman administration had, had evolved a, an anti-communist or anti-totalitarian stance. But they were also big, big financial uh, and moral backers of the nationalists of Chiang Kai-shek, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. And that went back into the, the war. The Americans had supported, surreptitiously had supported the, the government of China against the invading Japanese. <clears throat> and uh, they therefore continued that support. But there were also tensions within the UK side itself between the Foreign Office, which was particularly concerned about relations with America, and the Colonial Office, uh, which was actually housed in the same Whitehall building, but the Colonial Office was responsible for British colonies, including, of course, Hong Kong and Malaysia and Southeast Asia as well. So the Colonial Office wanted what they thought was best to support the then governor of Hong Kong, who was Sir Alexander Grantham. And Grantham was quite adamant that the best interests of Hong Kong was to keep out of this dispute. And he wished that planes had never, never arrived in, in Hong Kong. Of course, there were also tensions between the UK and the PRC, and the PRC and the USA. So there's several strands involved in the story. As I say, the UK stance was that ownership of the, of the planes was a legal matter for the courts. The government of, of Hong Kong, the government of the UK was not going to interfere in the, the dispute. The US stance was that the planes mustn't fall into communist hands. They thought, they feared that the planes, although they were not military, could be used to carry cargo uh, uh, and troops, paratroops particularly, ammunitions, stores and so on, and might be used in the invasion of Formosa, which was expected to come once the uh, communists had taken over the mainland. And they were also, the Americans were also concerned about the security of Southeast Asia. The French were facing a communist insurrection in what is now Vietnam. So the, uh, the American airline CAT entered into a contract of sale for the, air, air, uh, the airline assets, including the planes. That was quite a complicated contract of sale. The US thought that that would resolve the dispute. They got the nationalists to certify the sale in, in, in late December, it showed the papers to the foreign office and said, there you are, can you please give us our planes? Uh, and there was strong diplomatic pressure exerted in Washington uh, and in London and in Hong Kong. And the line taken by the US was, well, we own them, you can use executive action, you can use the police, 
to seize these planes and hang them over to our people, uh, Chenault and Willow. What was the Chinese attitude? Well, that that uh, was a bit more, more difficult to ascertain, but I think it was basically these planes are Chinese planes. Uh, the, the nationalists uh, are no longer the government of China, and after uh, early January 1949, they were recognized by Britain as uh, the communists were recognized by Britain as the legitimate government of China. So the planes are state property, and they now belong to the PRC, or the Central People's Government. The nationalists, of course, of course, said, well, we've sold them, they're no longer ours. But there were, was provision in the sale contract for the planes, etc., to go uh, under a limited company, a Delaware company, and for the nationalist government to acquire shares in that company if they so wished. So there was a sort of uh, buyback provision. Uh, there was litigation in Hong Kong, several sets of litigation, in fact, between CAT on the one hand and the workers and communist sympathizers, which had practical control over the planes. There were reciprocal injunctions against each other to prevent removal of the planes. Uh, and CAT applied for the appointment of an interim receiver to take charge of the planes as a neutral pending the outcome of the litigation. Uh, then the Hong Kong courts, the Chief Justice Gibson in February 1950, he refused to give the injunction. Uh, this caused consternation, consternation in the US and consternation um, uh, in the British government, both in Hong Kong and uh, in Whitehall. Uh, the, there was an appeal against his refusal to appoint a receiver. Uh, that went to the full court, which was in those days the appeal court in Hong Kong, and they heard it fairly promptly in May 1950, and they agreed with the Chief Justice that there should be no interim receiver. The main reason in both courts was sovereign immunity, state immunity. <clears throat> the, the workers holding the planes, the defendants in the action, had declared allegiance to the People's Republic. And now that was the government in China, recognized, as they say, by Britain, in fact, on the 6th of January, 1950. Uh, the judges said, well, the claims by CAT impugn the government of a foreign country. They impugn the, the government of the People's Republic, Central People's Government. So we have no jurisdiction over this matter. Simple as that. And that was an absolute bar to them deciding the question of title to the planes. Hence the consternation. In the US, uh, the uh, State Department said, uh, I beg your pardon, that the Republicans in the US, who were the majority in the Congress and, and were opposed, of course, to the Democratic administration, they said, oh, the Hong Kong courts have awarded the planes to the communists. Now that, of course, as a matter of law, was wrong. They had, they, the courts had simply refused to appoint receivers for the planes. But from a practical point of view, it meant that the planes remained in the hands of the communist sympathizers at Kai Tang. So in a way, that was right, that the, the, uh, the uh, planes were in the hands, remained in the hands of the communists and the State Department di diplomatists took the same line and so did the press, of course. In the UK, it was realized with horror that the courts had thwarted their plan to have the, the judges decide the question of ownership. There was no point in pursuing the matter to the Privy Council because the, even if the judges were wrong in Hong Kong, the appointment of receivers was a discretionary matter. So the, the, uh, all the Privy Council could do would be to send it back to the judges in Hong Kong uh, to reconsider if the judges in the Privy Council disagreed on the question of sovereign immunity. In fact, the, the Foreign Office lawyers, uh, the international e law experts, thought that the Hong Kong courts were wrong. They were mistaken about the uh, sovereign immunity point. 
but they realized that, uh, that there wasn't much they could do about it uh, because further appeal, as I say, would result in the matter simply being thrown back to the Hong Kong courts and would anyway take months uh, and the, uh, the, the, the matter would drag on. So the British government asked uh, its Attorney General, Sir, Sir Hartley Shawcross, for his advice. Uh, his advice was that this was not a legal question. There was no legal principle or precedent that governed the situation. Uh, and he said, he said, well, um, uh, may, maybe, I'm, maybe you could use uh, the Colonial Na Air Navigation Order, which was an, an ordering house that, that applied international uh, Chicago Convention about civil aviation to Hong Kong. And uh, he said, well, the, the, the convention says you have to register a plane in a certain jurisdiction. And both the PRC and the Americans are claiming the planes are theirs and have registered them. So we don't know whose they are from a as a matter of administration. <clears throat> so um, we're not going to allow anybody to fly the planes away until that's clarified. But Shawcross said that's only a temporary matter, and I'm not at all certain that's legally sound. Grantham was very upset. He thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have judicial review uh, and the prestige of Britain and my, my face will be damaged if you take that line. So he resisted Shawcross's uh, suggestion. Um, and Shawcross, in fact, uh, went to the British, British cabinet uh, with his advice. Uh, and then he said, actually, I think I'm wrong. So uh, I'm going to reconsider this. And uh, let me come back in a few weeks with a second opinion. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the colonial air navigation order I've mentioned, uh, Grantham pointed out that you could also use the emergency regulations. The emergency regulations ordinance uh, had been passed uh, back in the 1920s, I think. You remember that the government in Hong Kong used it in 2019 uh, to deal with a civil disorder in, in, in that year. Uh, and Shawcross didn't know about it. It's Grantham who pointed it out. He said, actually, we could use that, or, or we could use um, export prohibition as well, um, export controls. So Shawcross said, well, I, I didn't know about this, so that's much better than using this colonial air navigation order. But he said, I can think of something even better, and this is in his second opinion, we'll pass an order in council overriding sovereign immunity. And that suggestion was adopted by the cabinet with very little debate at all. They, he didn't point out to them that this was a breach of international convention. And of course, they didn't, they being politicians, they didn't realize. The, the, the only uh, opposition to it was uh, amongst left wing Labour politicians, but none of them were in the cabinet at the time. And their main reason was, well, we, we shouldn't just do what the Americans want. We should make our own minds up about this. So the suggestion was adopted with a little debate. So it, basically what Shawcross was saying was, we will just bulldoze sovereign immunity out of the way uh, so that the court can consider the merits, the claim to ownership uh, separately. Grantham was upset about this. He, th he thought that the planes were Chinese, they should go back to China, or we should just throw them in the harbour and get rid of it that way. Now, sovereign immunity, I'm sure many of you know what this, this is. It gov uh, government of one state is immune from suit in the courts of another state. Sovereign or state immunity. And until the 1970s, in, Brit in British uh, practice and uh, law, that was an absolute doctrine. Once the state was impugned, there was immunity. It was a customary rule of international law that had developed over, over a couple of centuries, but later it came to be embodied in a treaty as well. It's based on the idea of, of comity, that the, a sovereign is immune from suit in its own jurisdiction, unless it agrees to do so, and therefore extends the same privilege 
to sovereigns of other jurisdictions. Uh, and that this friendship, I suppose, in the interests of good relations and respect with uh, other nations, <clears throat> it's a reciprocal or mutual benefit that the countries are applying to each other. And it recognizes, of course, their equality and independence. And the immunity extends to anything which impugns a foreign government. So the foreign government doesn't have to be a party to the suit to have this benefit. It's if it's affected in some way by a potential decision of the courts, affected by the decision. And that was the reasoning of the Hong Kong courts was, well, although the PRC or the Central People's Government isn't actually a party to this litigation, it will be affected by it through its agents, those holding the planes at Kai Tak. Now, whether that is correct is doubtful because how could these workers be agents of a newly founded communist government. They were working for the airlines. They were the agents of the airlines, not of the government. But I suppose the argument was, well, the airlines are controlled in effect by the communist government now, and therefore it affects them. And certainly the removal of immu immunity from the central people's government was disrespectful to it, even insulting, undignified. Uh, and was actually contrary to the British desire to cultivate relations with the PRC so as to uh, further British interests, particularly commercial interests in China. But this just didn't feature really. Shawcross, Shawcross said, well, um, it may, really it's now a remote possibility and by May of 1950. It's only a remote possibility that we can salvage our position in China or even establish diplomatic relations with the new regime. Because the new regime, once they were recognized by Britain, said, thank you very much. Can we now discuss diplomatic relations? Now, this was a shock to Britain. They thought it was automatic diplomatic relations. And, and the uh, uh, communists said, um, uh, we want to discuss membership of the Uni United Nations, your representation in Taiwan, and also our aeroplanes at Kai Tak. We want you to give us our planes back, please, before we will discuss diplomatic relations. So this was a shock to Britain, who thought, oh, now, now we'll all be friends, won't we? <clears throat> so Shawcross didn't directly consider the, 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 uh, the insults that was uh, being uh, hit to the CPG, he just said, well, as a matter of politics, it's un unlikely that we'll be able to establish ourselves in good relations with them. Um, and certainly the cabinet didn't consider it either. Grantham was unhappy, as I, I've mentioned, but of course he had to put up with it. He said, oh, I'm, I'm a mere colonial governor, I can't do it. That's a slight exaggeration. He certainly made his views known to the colonials. So on the 10th of May, 1950, <laughs> the Supreme Court of Hong Kong brackets jurisdiction close brackets order 1950 <laughs> was passed or was enacted by the King's Privy Council. <laughs> now the Privy Council is of course an advisor to the, the sovereign, at least in theory, you know, in practice it's part, it does what the British government says, it's part of the royal prerogative, and, and the ordering council procedure is often used, was often used, to implement treaties in the UK colonies and dependencies. Uh, so this was in effect legislation by the executive. Of course, uh, it would have been possible to propose to the Hong Kong Legislative Council that they uh, override sovereign immunity by an ordinance. But Shawcross didn't like that. So I think partly because he, he knew that the attitude in Hong Kong was let's placate these new masters in Peking in Hong Kong's interests. But, but also if it was done by the central British government, by the government, by Whitehall, 
it would distance Hong Kong from that decision and so to some extent protect Hong Kong from the consequences. And the UK government uh, announced that the order was designed only to maintain uh, what they called British standards of impartial justice in the case and meet the requirements of international law. That's actually what they said. So they, they were blissfully unaware. They, they were violating international law by the very passing of this order. Now, the Order and Council said in any proceedings concerning the aircraft, including the equipment, which may be instituted in the Supreme Court of Hong Kong after the coming into force of this order, it shall not be a bar to the jurisdiction of the court that the proceedings implead a foreign state, a foreign sovereign state. Simple as that. <clears throat> and it, it provided for an inquiry rather than a trial. Uh, this was uh, an inquiry to adjudicate the question of ownership. And the, the, the uh, Chief Justice was to conduct a full investigation into the matter, into the question of ownership. And that would be despite the absence of any parties to the dispute. So Shawcross and the Foreign Office did realise that the likely reaction of uh, the Pe People's Republic was, I'm not going to get involved in this. This is a fix uh, and you've insulted us, so we're not going to take part in your game. And that's exactly what, what happened. So the Chief Justice was al allowed, indeed directed, uh, to use evidence from previous proceedings in his investigation. And the Order in Council also provided for appeal to the full court and the Privy Council and in, empowered the government to prevent the removal of the claims in the interim until the matter was finally resolved. What was the mainland reaction? Well, it followed on the 21st of May, the official reaction by Zheng Han Fu, who was the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. He stated that Great Britain was exhibiting a most unfriendly attitude to his government and warned that unless the order in council was rescinded, the People's Republic would have reason to doubt Britain's desire to establish diplomatic relations. So there was the threat from China was, we're not going to have diplomatic relations with you until you do what, what we want and get rid of this order. However, significantly, the PRC organized no protests, no demonstrations, uh, no disturbances, no strikes in Hong Kong. They just verbally protested. No embargoes, no shows of force. But they did refuse to participate in the subsequent litigation. Uh, CAT promptly started new proceedings. Uh, naming the workers and, and communist sympathisers so far as they could be identified, who were holding the planes, but they didn't appear. There was a, a, a new Chief Justice, Chief Justice Howe. He duly conducted in, an inquiry in March of 1951, but he still found for the defendants, despite the fact that there was no sovereign immunity, and despite the fact that they didn't turn up. And I imagine the reason that he did that was that he feared the reaction from China and the effect on Hong Kong. The appeal was promptly heard by the full court in August of 1951. Uh, they delivered their reasons at the end of that year and affirmed the Chief Justice's decision, although by a majority on, on one aspect of the case. So the, the Hong Kong courts held the position, held the line, that they would, in effect, were not going to take these planes away from the workers, despite sovereign immunity not being allowed. Now, how did they reach that conclusion? Well, the argument of CAT was, of course, straightforward. The planes had been sold to them by the nationalists. The nationalists at that time were recognised by Britain as the uh, so sovereign government of China. That was December 1949. And that sale was the disposal of state assets, uh, which, and, and any, any dealing bound a successor government. 
under the principle of continuity. So now we come to another principle of in public international law, which is that uh, an in insurgent government, a new government, succeeds to the rights and interests and the obligations of the successor government. So steps into the shoes, uh, the, the communists stepped into the shoes of the nationalists were automatically bound by this contract. Continuity is part, part, part of the law of state succession. <clears throat> so the legal presumption that the contracts of the old government bind the new one. How then did the Hong Kong courts get round that? Well, they found that there were two exceptions to that principle. Uh, first, two acts of, acts of the old government, which were ultra vares, that didn't apply here. But secondly, two acts of the old government uh, done not in good faith as trustees of the state, but for an alien and improper purpose. Now, that exception came from obiter dictum of a new judge in the, in the British Court, the English Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Denning. Lord Justice Denning had recently decided a case concerning the Polish government in exile called Boleskowski. It eventually went to the House of Lords in England. But at the time of the Hong Kong judgments, it was a, only a Court of Appeal decision. <laughs> uh, and what Denning said in effect was that if, if the, the old government has uh, not acted in good faith as trustees of the state, of, of the property of the state, but for an alien purpose, then uh, the law of state succession doesn't apply. The automatic succession doesn't apply. How the Chief Justice Howe and the full court latched on to that second exception and declared that the sale of the planes was against the interests of the Chinese people and was incompatible with acting with the trust, uh, as trustees of state, those state assets. So in effect, that was a political decision, of course, that reaching that conclusion. And the judgments, the Hong Kong judgments, are, are, are uh, replete with uh, effectively political, emotional uh, reasoning uh, so that they could say so this falls within Denning's principle. They said that the nationalist government had only ever owned the aircraft as trustees and had not sold them for purposes, uh, legitimate purposes, purposes of fighting to retain territory. Because at the time of the sale, December, mid-December 1949, the nationalists had decamped to Taiwan they had, to all intents and purposes, lost the civil war, uh, and therefore what they were doing was simply uh, selling the planes to spite the incoming government. So the contract, they, the Hong Kong court said, was not valid and not enforceable. Now, it should be said that the contract did contain some rather suspicious provisions. For instance, CAT, the Americans, didn't pay for the planes, they simply promised to pay. They gave promissory notes for the, uh, the right to the property. Property wasn't delivered, you'd expect normally in a sale, of course, there'd be delivery of the goods, but they weren't delivered, of course, because they were in Hong Kong and in the hands of the insurgent workers. So there were, there were reasons for the Hong Kong courts to be uh, suspicious. <coughs> The, the, the appeal by, by the Chief Justice was expedited to the, the full court, um, despite, uh, the, 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 um, despite the ordering council allowing any party to intervene at any stage, the CPG uh, still boycotted the proceedings in the, the full court. But the full court, both, uh, judges both relied on the obiter dicta of uh, Denny. And there was uh, one judge in the full court named Gould, who's a New Zealander, and he's the one Hong Kong judge who really does emerge with credit from the legal saga. He said the sale was a device to prevent the planes, the assets, 
falling into the hands of the CPG. And at the time of the sale, the nationalists knew that they were losing the war, uh, so did the purchasers, and that they were also aware that Britain was about to recognize the new government. Um, and this, they knew also that the Central People's Government was already claiming the, the planes, which were subject to court injunction, uh, and uh, that these planes were particularly associated with China. I suppose he means that the, the airlines were Chinese airlines. <coughs> And he went on to say the contracts sought to deprive the Chinese people and their government of the benefit of the players and were particularly valuable in China because it's a vast territory, a poor country. It really needed the players uh, and it was being deprived of them. Uh, and they, also the judges pointed out that under the terms of the contract, they could, uh, the, the um, uh, nationalist government could regain an interest in the planes through being able to buy shares in the, the new holding co corporation that was going to be set up. So as a result, Chinese people would be deprived of public asset of immense value to their country because the contract was hostile to the de jure government and to the interests of the Chinese people. It was a breach of the tr of trusteeship for an alien and improper purpose. Of course, by the time that the Hong Kong judges considered it, the de jure government of China was the uh, Central People's Government, the Communist Government. At the time of the sale in December, the de jure government had been the nationalist Kuomintang government. So we, there you are, we had over the political reasons given by the Hong Kong judges. And uh, the language they used, well, apart from the result, was deferential to the Central People's Government, PRC. Uh, and you can well uh, understand why that was the case, uh, sitting in Hong Kong with this new government to, to the north, being uncertain of their attitude towards this little colonial outpost at the bottom of China. Uh, they didn't want to do anything to antagonize that new government, and neither did Governor Granson, who no doubt in, in the Hong Kong club and elsewhere was, was talking to the judges about it. So it was, it was in effect, a, a political uh, decision. It, it had some, some merit. Uh, I, in the book, I analyze, attempt to analyze it as a sort of case note, if you like, to see whether to what extent it holds water. It was not totally devoid of, of legal merits, as it happens, but it was rather shaky, I, I, I must say. <clears throat> the case went on to the Privy Council in July of 1952. No expense was, was spared, incidentally, by, by the Americans in this. They employed many local council in the case, including local KCs, and they also employed uh, big name lawyers from the UK and, and you know, they flew out a, a KC to argue the case in Hong Kong. He, he must have spent a long time getting to Hong Kong in those days because you had to fly by about half a dozen uh, intermediate stops, but it was to no avail employing him. Uh, and when the, they got to the Privy Council in June, to, sorry, July, 1952, an expedited hearing, uh, who should represent the Americans, uh, but Hartley Shawcross, the man who had actually proposed the ordering council uh, and who had overseen the drafting of the provisions of that order. He had left government in the meantime, the Labour government he was a member of had been defeated, incoming Conservative government was even more pro-American, uh, and Shawcross had resumed private practice. And of course, he was the, the, the best person from the American point of view to represent them before the Privy Council. No question of any conflict of interest there. And uh, he, I think he, he actually managed to get a, 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 an expedited hearing to his influence there. This is somewhat speculative on my, my part. Uh, and his, his uh, submission uh, 
Well, the Privy Council was, uh, of course, very eminent. The judges were, were effectively members of the House of Lords, uh, the highest court in the UK. And the judge who was selected to decide the, or chair the uh, hearing was Viscount Simon, who, had, who was a very distinguished Chancery lawyer, but he also held pretty well every senior position in British government over the last 20 odd years. He was, he was in his 80s by then, but still very sharp. Uh, and so he was very attuned to the politics of this. Uh, and he and his colleagues said, well, the, the government is not a trustee in any legal sense. In other words, they disagreed with Denning, Denning's view. They said, oh, that's obiter. Uh, uh, and it's notable that Denning accepted the principle, principle of state succession. Uh, he was talking in that context, and really but the exception was just mentioned in passing. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Hong Kong court's inference that there'd been a breach was wrong, said the Privy Council. Uh, it's, th this is not a matter for the courts. At the time of the sale in December 1949, the nationalists were the de jure government. They held the property in the plains and the assets. The plains were in Hong Kong, which was neutral territory, wasn't under con communist control. Uh, and it was open, therefore, to the nationalists to sell the plains. And their motive to deprive the communists was just irrelevant. Yes, the nationalists were in retreat, but they were still resisting. The, uh, the, the Civil War, and they likened the sale to the blowing up of an ammunition store by an army in retreat. Now, if you think about that, there is a certain difficulty with that analogy, but that's that's their, their reason. Um, and they also said that the Hong Kong court's suggestion that the parties to the contract knew that withdrawal of recognition by Britain was imminent was speculative. Well, I, I have difficulty with that because it must have been very well known around the corridors of power, both in London and in Washington, that the British government was on the verge of recognizing the new regime. And indeed the cabinet had decided that uh, just a few days after the sale, we now know, they had decided that recognition would take place uh, as soon as convenient. In fact, it took place in the new year, 1950. Uh, so I think that that, that was um, over-egging the pudding by, by the Privy Council in saying that was just speculation. And they also said that the Chief Justice's suggestion that the sale was inim inimical to the interests of the Chinese people. Um, well, that we can't, we can't, take that line, British courts cannot take it on themselves to pronounce whether a foreign government recognized by her, his majesty, her majesty's government by 1952 is, is acting contrary to the interests of its people, it's political. <clears throat> However, they didn't entirely dismiss Jennings' uh, exception, his, his, his qualification to the general principle uh, they, they said the Privy Council must not be understood to reject the possibility of our courts refusing in a conceivable case to recognise the validity of the disposal of state property by a government on the eve of its fall. So he just left that possibility open. And they gave the example of a sale of a despot who knows recognition is, is on, the, on the verge of being withdrawn, drawn, and it's clear that his purpose in selling was to abscond with the proceeds or make away with the assets for some private purpose. So the, to, to that very limited extent, which looks like it was a compromise behind the scenes by the Privy Council judges, that some of these of them didn't want to just say Denning was wrong. Uh, to that very limited extent, they preserved that qualification or exception to the principle of sovereign state and unity. But to, to all intents and purposes, the uh, doctrine of state and unity uh, survived the uh, decision. So that, there you are. There, there, there are lots of other interesting issues, 
in the case and politics and diplomacy and personalities, lots of colorful uh, personalities in the story. That's why the book is so long. I have just selected two international legal issues. There are other le international legal issues in the case as well to expand on today uh, in the hope that it, it will whet your appetite. Uh, and with that, I'll close and invite any of you here today or indeed any of you uh, looking uh, online or zooming in, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, I'd be, I'd be uh, willing to try to try to deal with them. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, most of you all agree after listening to Malcolm's talk that this is in fact a most interesting uh, topic, a uh, very fascinating illustration of the interaction of law and politics and, and the role of the judiciary and its relationship with the government. So um, uh, maybe we will we'll now uh, open the floor. Uh, anyone can ask questions or give comments. What, what happened to the plane in the end? <laughs> Well, I wanted to leave that bill for, for people who bought the book <laughs> so have some, some reward for it. Uh, they, the, the, the planes ended up in various parts of the world, actually, uh, but their value had diminished greatly after three years on the tarmac contact, as you can, you can imagine. So the CAT in the American interests really didn't get their money back at the end of it. It was a sort of pyrrhic victory for them. So some of the planes had disintegrated, others were dismantled, and the few that were still um, intact had a lot of money had to be spent on them to make them airworthy. Thank you. Oh. Yes, Paul. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. I, I have the book. Oh well, wow. <laughs> I I bought it a few weeks ago. I haven't been ready. This is rather good to, to be talked through the book by the author. So thank you very much. Can I, I also? I do have questions. I, I teach a course of relating to state immunity, particularly in regard to sovereign debt. And I was saying in class yesterday that one of the problems and one of the interests of this the field is something you quote Justice Gilder saying, the lack of precedent. Can I ask two things? First of all, did any cases or disputes arise with regard to fixed assets that might have been in Hong Kong and claimed by the incoming? government. Um, I just wonder whether this is something which exists as a the narrative and as a structure of, of, of this intersection between public and private law because of the nature of the movable asset, movable object. Um, um, yes. and, and the second thing, you, something I don't understand, but I haven't read everything yet. The sale of the aircraft, however contrived it might have been, said to have been for promising notes rather than cash. What's wrong with that? Uh, th there's nothing wrong with that, um, <laughs> except it's a bit suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> you, but why didn't, why didn't, if you're buying the aircraft, you know, if you're the American interests buying the aircraft, why don't, why don't you pay for them? Uh, and, and the Hong Kong judges, they, they, they sort of made a list of what they regarded as suspicious circumstances or unusual circumstances. Uh, because they said this, this, is, this is just a device, it's not a true, a real contract. And that was simply one of the things that they highlighted. Uh, you're quite right, it's a commercial matter. It, it would be perfectly normal to use pr promissory notes or some sort of credit arrangement. Uh, but, but in this one, because it was such a unique matter, I suppose, they thought this is, this is a bit fishy. Why aren't they paying up front for the, for the aircraft? Was another explanation for that was because the aircraft couldn't be delivered. So they're not going to pay for them until they get the uh, but, but the uh, the aircraft, this is the unusualness of the, of, of the situation. So the aircraft were in, uh, in the territory of neither of the contracting parties. They were in neutral Hong Kong. And neutral Hong Kong had, had a, a practical interest in what was going to happen to those assets yeah. anyway. Now, to turn to your first question, that, that was about, um, remind me, well, what is it? Whether the, the peculiarity of the case is a question that it threw up, mm. politically, as well as legal, yeah. would it have been anything like the same 
complex narrative with, well, I, with, in, with regard to land or fixed assets. Yeah, the, the fixed assets. Um, well, the, the assets were distributed between Kaitak, uh, Kaitak perimeter, uh, the two go-downs in, uh, around Kaitak and around Ka uh, Kowloon City, uh, and I suppose the leases in Central as well, I haven't investigated mm -hmm. that, um, and, and no doubt various other odds and ends as well. But some of the assets were shipped out during the Ampas. They were shipped out by the communists on British boats, <laughs> on Hong Kong boats. The Americans are very upset about it. So some of, that, some of the assets had already gone away. Um, but the ordering council treated all the assets of the airlines, not just the planes, as the subject of the decision. So the, the, actually, the, the definition of the aircraft included all the other assets in the ordering council. So they thought of that and, and said in the ordering council that Governor Granson could hold those assets, all of them, and, and stop them being removed from the jurisdiction. So there was no practical difference between fixed assets and others, and planes and others. But leaving CAT to one side, were there any claims against other assets in Hong Kong that would have accrued to the, the success of state of uh, Not that I'm aware of. There was a claim in California where CNAC and or CATC had some money uh, 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 and CAT claimed those assets and of course was awarded those by the American judge. Yeah, okay. uh, so there was, there was some money out, uh, outside the outside Hong Kong. But just to follow up uh, on the uh, first question, uh, you, you said the planes uh, were uh, eventually, you know, um, Moved all over the world, uh, mm. but but was, was there any was there any judgment of the court which could be enforced by the American company, which can lead to their getting control of the plane? Well, there was no need, uh, Albert, for that because the the ordering council had actually stipulated that the governor of Hong Kong would be responsible for both holding and disposing of the assets. So once the Privy, immediately when the Privy Council declared the result, before they gave their reasons, they, they, in July 1952, they, they announced the bare result. And within 24 hours, the Hong Kong police had gone to Tuk Kai Tak with their vans and an armoured car and had rounded up the, uh, the, the workers holding the planes and secured the planes and the planes were then handed over to CAT representatives, and they they made provision for a, a ship or for ships to come to Hong Kong to take away the planes, uh, loaded them over uh, over the uh, the wall in effect at Kai Tak onto onto boats, American boats, which came to take them, including incidentally a U.S. aircraft carrier. So it's quite plain what was happening. And indeed, CAT had become a, owned by the CIA. And I think this General Chinot, uh, is he the very famous uh, American um, pilot who helped uh, China to to defend against the Japanese uh, by flying, by leading a squadron of Things, yes, uh, yeah, by the Japanese. That's quite right, Albert. The, the American defense volunteers formed by Chenault uh, with this chap, Corcoran, uh, at the instigation of President Roosevelt, surreptitiously, before America entered the war, before Pearl Harbor. Uh, There's a lot of sympathy for uh, the Chinese government fight, fighting the Japanese, and this was one way that the Americans helped. Chenault was already in China. He'd been invalided out of the U.S. Army Air Force in the 1930s, I think. And he uh, set himself up as, an effect, an aviation expert and identified China as a future uh, commercial uh, uh, 
potential for, for him. And so he'd gone there and made friends with Chiang Kai-shek and his wife and been, become their aviation. He set up the Flying Tigers, these volunteers who were volunteers from the American forces who wanted a bit of action. So that they, as you say, they flew uh, supplies over the so-called hump from Burma uh, to Southwest China to help with the resistance. And they got lots of sympathetic publicity in the US. I think, think partly because the US felt guilty about not helping China more overtly, uh, but, but all, also because Chenault and his, his uh, colleagues, his, his compatriots, they were all very good at, at political influence in Washington and getting publicity in the American press. So that they became famous to probably to a greater extent than they actually merit. And I think that the wife of General is was a Chinese who was a very famous personality. She became famous. She, she was a, a journalist. I think she, she was a cub reporter. She was educated in, in China and I think also the US, but she was a cub reporter on um, with new, what became New China News Agents uh, in, in Hong Kong. <laughs> and she met uh, Shen Alt and became his second wife. That's right. And after he died in the late 1950s. And after that, she set herself up in Washington uh, as a nationalist um, sympathizer and funneled a lot of money to the Republican Party to uh, further what was in those days in America called the Chinat or Chinat interests, in other words, the nationalists, the Taiwanese um, interests in America. And she was, for instance, a friend of President Nixon and so on. Just a quick point. There is one other aspect in terms of political background and that would be the war in Korea. Because at that point, Britain and the Commonwealth were part of the UN forces who were in direct combat against the People's Republic of China. So I imagine that impinged. Yes, that, that really changed, changed everything. I think the Korean War broke out in June 1950 and China intervened in October of that mm -hmm. year. And, and you see it as a, in those months, there's a big change in the attitude on the British side, particularly. And the Foreign Office was minuting that you know, there can be no question of allowing these planes to get into communist hands now. Uh, yeah. Whether the Americans get them is another question, but we will not let the communists get them. They were, they, all along, they'd been secretly telling the State Department that was actually what was going to happen, even, even if the outcome was not to the Americans liking the outcome of the, the litigation. So yes, once the, once the Korean War started, it changed the, the attitude of uh, uh, the whole situation, really. I've got an online question from Mr. Brendan Cliff. Um, Hello, Brendan. I'll tell you a wonderful book on the unruly new territories and now this book. Um, what are your plans for the third installment of the trilogy? Was there a trilogy? <laughs> I think we better better come clean, Brendan. That Brendan actually edited both those books <laughs> for me. He did a superb job, I would say. Uh, well, any ideas welcome, Brendan. Um, it, I, I, I'm not going to rush back into it. If if there's a, a good story that arises, if you can think of anything that's interesting, uh, then I'll, I'll certainly have a go at it. Now, now I'm sort of retired although I'm working on the new edition of Tenancy Law, as it happens, uh, then I, I'm very willing to set my hand to some more historical stuff. But I very much doubt that I'll be able to find a more interesting su subject than the one for this book. Uh, I think I, I do have a copy of uh, your Tenancy Law book, which was published maybe 30 <laughs> or more years ago. First published 1985, <laughs> so that's right. Yeah. So is there any final question or comment before we close? If not, then uh, may I thank uh, all of you for, uh, for attending, including our audience online, and also thank our very distinguished speaker. So, so I hope you'll right. come again. Uh, in the, okay. uh, oh, oh, that, that, right, I'm, I'm obliged to write another book. <laughs>
Bye bye.